This episode is sponsored by Hawthorne. What is going on Disney fans? My name is John Solo and a week from today, Disney is releasing Cruella, the origin story for one of the most infamous and despised villains they've ever put on screen, Cruella de Vil. The fur-obsessed sociopath who would happily strangle a hundred puppies just to get a few compliments on the coat she makes from their fur. She's evil to the core with absolutely no redeeming qualities, unless you're into that sort of thing. And since Disney wanted to explore the origins of the She-Witch and what she could have possibly gone through to make make her so psychotic, I thought I would explore the origins of the movies that made her so famous. The 1961 animated classic 101 Dalmatians and the 1996 live action remake. You might be surprised to hear that both films were based on a full-length children's novel of the same name. It was written back in 1956 by Dodie Smith, who you probably won't be surprised to hear was obsessed with Dalmatians. At one point, she and her husband had nine of them, and one day when they were hosting a little get-together, her friend actually commented that her dogs would make a lovely fur coat. Definitely not a normal thing to say, but in this case, I'm glad she did because it inspired Dodie to write the fun, charming, and exciting novel that led to the creation of those Disney classics. But don't let those descriptors fool you, Solo fam. This book is as dark as a Dalmatian spots. And if you thought the Disney DeVilles were evil, just wait until you get a load of Dodies. Today, I'm gonna be breaking down her original story in its entirety while also drawing connections to the parts of each movie it inspired. Before I get into it though, I've got to give a shout out to this episode's sponsor, Hawthorne. The villain of today's story is obsessed with what she wears, but there's a reason she's the villain. She had it all wrong. Sure, fashion is important, but if you really want to look and feel your best, you've got to take care of your skin and hair, which is why I'm so excited to tell you about today's sponsor, Hawthorne. They're a premium men's grooming brand that tailors your personal care routine to your unique profile. You start out by taking a quiz about yourself where you answer questions about your skin and hair type, the type of deodorant you use, the kind of scents you prefer, and what your daily routine entails. It gets pretty in depth, but only takes a few minutes. And at the end, you get a list of products that are tailored to your body type and lifestyle. I decided to start my membership off with a strong foundation and went with the Essentials Bundle. It came with a bunch of useful stuff for a desert dweller like myself, including hydrating face cleanser, body lotion, and wait for it, sunscreen from a face. I also got these work and play colognes, which is great because I'm a grown man who knows nothing about cologne, so now I'm totally covered no matter what the occasion. And what I really love about Hawthorne, besides their products giving me great results and smelling how Zeus probably smelled, as my wife put it, is that if you somehow don't like what they send you, you can return it for free and they'll send you something else. With how easy Hawthorne makes the process, there's no reason not to give them a chance. Go to hawthorne.co and take their quiz to get your personalized self-care routine, then you Use promo code John Solo to get 10% off your entire first order. That's H A W T H O R N E dot C O, promo code John Solo. Hawthorne dot C O, promo code John Solo. And we're back, so let's get started. If you haven't already, I would greatly appreciate you hitting that like button because it really does help the channel grow. Subscribe to have new messed up content like this delivered to your sub box every week. And now, the messed up origins of 101 Dalmatians. So there are two things you should probably know before I start this breakdown. One, for the first time in I don't know how long, maybe ever, I am not doing a recap of either Disney film. The reason for that is, as a whole, their plots are pretty similar to the book, and I think it would be tremendously redundant to explain them both. So instead, I'm just gonna break down the book story and point out the similarities and differences to the movie variants as we go along. And two, because I don't think I'm gonna get very far before she tries to make an appearance anyway, I wanna introduce you to the newest and fluffiest member of the Solo fam. Everybody, meet Penny. We were originally gonna follow in DeVille's footsteps and make a coat out of her, but she turned out to be way too tiny for that, so she's just gonna be our personal Disney princess instead. And actually, not long after we got her, we realized that there was an actual dog named Penny in 101 Dalmatians, so pretty appropriate time for her to make her debut. So now that that's all out of the way, let's get into the story. Chapter 1 opens by introducing the reader to Pongo and Mrs. Pongo, a married couple of dogs living in London who were owned by a married couple named Mr. and Mrs. Dearly, though according to Pongo and Mrs., the ownership goes the other way around. 
Now, as you can see, unlike both films where Pongo essentially rigs a meet cute in the park and the couple falls in love at first sight, this story starts with them being together and their home life is quite a bit different than those versions. Instead of Mr. Dearly being a struggling musician named Roger Radcliffe, or even more bizarre, a struggling video game designer from America, he's described as a financial wizard who helped the UK's government fix the national debt, and as a result was lent a house and exempted from paying taxes. Also living in their house is their two childhood nannies, Nanny Cook and Nanny Butler, who are condensed into the singular character simply called Nanny in both films. One day, while the couple takes a walk with Pongo and Mrs., they happen to run into Mrs. Dearly's old classmate, Corella DeVille, who was apparently expelled from school for drinking ink. Now, don't get me wrong, that is a crazy thing to do, but an expulsion seems a little harsh. The cartoon also describes Corella as an old schoolmate of Mrs. Dearly's, but in the live action adaptation, she's her boss at the fashion brand, House of DeVille. In fact, it's actually Anita sketching that inspires Cruella to make a Dalmatian code in the first place, where in the book she gets the idea just by seeing the dogs in person. If we make this coat, it would be as if I were wearing your dog. <laughs> <laughs> woof, woof. <laughs> As for the cartoon, she seems to know about the puppies before she even makes her first appearance, being that she barges into the house and starts frantically looking around for them like I do whenever I lose my wife in the grocery store. So after ruining the happy couple's afternoon walk and seeing their beautiful Dalmatians, Cruella insists that they follow her inside her house and meet her husband. He's a furrier and it's to him she makes the extremely appropriate comment, wouldn't those dogs make excellent fur coats? Now, for reasons I can't explain, the entire husband character is left out of the cartoon. However, in the live action film, we get the Skinner in his place. He's not married to Cruella, but he is the guy who makes all of her coats for her. In the next chapter, the Dearlies, who aren't given the first names Roger and Anita like in the movies, are forced to go to a dinner party at Cruella's where everything tastes like pepper. And then, because they're polite, they invite the devil woman, I mean, DeVille woman, to their house for dinner the following night. The Dearly's dinner party ends early though because the pregnant Mrs. Pongo has gone into labor. Everyone leaves except for Cruella who demands to see the puppies. Only when she sees them, she is horrified to see they don't have any spots and says they all must be drowned at once just like she drowns the kittens of her Persian cat because she's always mating with strays. Yeah, we're only two chapters in and this nut job is already bragging about drowning kittens. You guys are in for a ride even wilder than Mr. Toad's. Anyway, Cruella is kicked out and Mrs. goes on to have 15 puppies that night. And just like in the movies, one of them almost dies until Mr. Dearly gently massages it to work air into its lungs. At least I think that's what he was doing. It was either that or dark magic. Now, while it isn't likely, it's actually not uncommon for Dalmatians to have litters of 15 puppies. In fact, the author herself experienced that with her own Dalmatian. But a litter of that size is a lot of work for the mother so the Dearlies went searching for a foster mother to help with the feeding, and it's here that we're introduced to Perdita. See, in the movies, Perdita and Mrs. are condensed into a single character and named Perdita, which I think makes sense for that format. But in the book, the entirety of chapter three is about the search for Perdita and her backstory. Basically, she was a farmer's dog who ran away from her home in the country to find herself a husband, and once in town, she came across a rather handsome liver-spotted Dalmatian and it was love at first sight for the both of them. They ran into the woods together, made sweet puppy love, and agreed to marry, but their owners tracked them down and dragged them back to their respective homes. Perdita went on to give birth to a litter of her own Dalmatian puppies out on the farm and they came out beautifully. So beautifully, the farmer sold them without her knowledge. When Perdita woke up to find her puppies missing, she left home to find them and was unsuccessful. By the time she gave up on her search, she was starving, it was storming, and she was covered in mud. It wasn't until Mrs. Dearly almost hit her with her car that she was rescued and brought home. Or should I say, brought to her new home. And in quite the plot twist, because Perdita was so covered in mud when she found her, Mrs. Dearly didn't even realize she was a Dalmatian until they washed her off. Then, after eating some food to restore her strength, Perdita was able to use the milk that would have originally gone to her own babies to feed Mrs. and Pongos. After about two weeks, the pups start developing their spots as well as their personalities and are given names to reflect that. The prettiest pup was the small one that Mr. Dearly saved, and they called her Cad Pig because that's another name for the runt in a pig 
pig litter. In the movie though, they make her a boy and call her Lucky, which is a bit confusing because Lucky is a separate dog in the book and actually the smartest of them all. Though he does have a horseshoe of spots like in the movie. Other puppies include a little fat boy named Roly Poly and Patch, whose ear was almost solid black along with one side of his face, which apparently makes him less valuable. So in both movies, Cruella makes a big show of trying to buy the puppies and does not hide her rage when she's turned down. I'm through with all of you. I'll get even. Just wait. You'll be sorry, you fools. You, you idiots. I'm through with all of you. I'll get even. Just wait. You'll be sorry, you fools. You idiots. Then, after being rejected, her cronies, Horace and Jasper, force their way into the house when the Dearlies aren't home and lock the nanny away while they make off with the pups. In the book, she's a lot more subtle with her plan. Instead of loudly swearing revenge when her attempt to buy them is turned down, she simply visits the house when the Dearlies and Nanny Butler are out on a walk and distracts Nanny Cook while her cronies, Saul and Jasper Budden, steal the pups from the fenced-in backyard where they were playing. Now, a detail consistent across all versions of the story is that Mr. Dearly puts big, expensive ads for the missing dogs on the front pages of the newspaper, which helps spread awareness. But when those ads don't result in any new leads, Pongo resorts to the gossip chain known as the Twilight Barking, which is basically a play on the fact that one dog's bark can set off an entire neighborhood of dogs. The way it goes down is that Pongo and Mrs. take their pets for a walk while Perdita hangs out with the nanny. So when they get to the top of a hill, they bark to any dogs with an earshot to let them know their puppies are missing. Missing. Any dogs who hear, which in this case is a Great Dane, just like in the cartoon, pass it along. And in just a few hours, 480 dogs have relayed the message 60 miles out from London. The following night, a sheepdog known as the Colonel, who had heard the twilight barking and knew all about the missing puppies, just so happened to be walking by an old abandoned mansion in Suffolk when a white bone with SOS carved into it flew over the gate and landed in front of him. After sending his friend, the tabby cat, into the mansion to see what was up and almost getting her killed in the process, she reported to him that the house was seething with Dalmatian puppies. He promptly reported it back to London by way of the twilight barking and Pongo and Mrs. responded that they would be leaving to rescue their babies that night. And that is exactly what happens. They eat a full-size dinner to ready them themselves, tell Perdita to watch over the Dearlies while they're gone since she's still too weak to join them, and after everyone's gone to sleep, they sneak out through an open window. In the cartoon, we're sort of left to assume they snuck out because they don't receive the message until late in the night and in the next scene they're in the park talking to the Great Dane. But in the 1996 version, Pago and Perdita receive the message in the middle of the day and break out of the house in full view of everyone. Serious question though, what is that button? Never in my life have I seen a house with that setup. Were those a real thing at one point, or is this part of the weird movie universe that Disney made up? Anyway, back to the book, after traveling a few miles and stopping to rest, Pongo reveals the entirety of what he heard through the twilight barking since Mrs. couldn't make it all out. The place where their puppies were found is called Hell Hall and is owned by the DeVille family, which means their puppies were most likely stolen to be made into coats by Cruella's husband. Naturally, Mrs. is horrified to hear this, but it gives her the strength to continue on into the cold and dark winter night. So the next few chapters detail the journey of Pongo and Mrs. as they cross the English countryside. And while they are interesting to read, they are not gonna be very entertaining for me to break down. Not to mention, there isn't much to compare. The animated movie pretty much skips over their whole adventure minus a battle with the elements. And the only bit we get in the live action one is a bird helping them cross an electric fence. To put it simply though, their journey has the same vibes as the 1925 serum run to Nome, Alaska. And if you don't know what I'm referring to, that means you definitely didn't watch my video about Balto, and for that, I can never forgive you. Essentially, food and hospitality for Pongo and Mrs. is arranged across their entire route, with any dogs they meet being as kind, helpful, and respectful as possible for the parents who are just trying to save their puppies. They run into a few snags, like a little kid throwing rocks at Pongo and injuring his leg, but by the beginning of chapter 10, they finally run into the same tabby cat who found their puppies in Hell Hall. She happily reports that she just saw the puppies yesterday and that there is 
lively and fat as ever, then leads them to the Colonel. But on the way there, they catch a glimpse of the DeVille residence, which is the scariest house that either of them had ever seen. It was all black and the windows were mostly bricked up, which gave the house a look similar to a distorted, screaming face. Next, they meet the Colonel, who they thought was going to be a dapper military man, but instead was a grizzly war veteran, and he updates them on everything he knows about the situation. It's here that we get a little history lesson on Hal Hall and Corella DeVille's ancestors, and brace yourself because this gets real weird. The legend is that an ancestor of Corella's bought the house from a farmer named Hill who had gotten into debt, and his plan was to convert it into a castle. But he'd only gotten so far as to build the outside wall when the villagers from the nearby town grew concerned over the screams and maniacal laughter that came from behind the gate. So they formed an angry mob and planned to storm the premises. But suddenly a thunderstorm came out of nowhere and put all the torches out, then the gates flew open of their own accord and DeVille drove through them while emitting forked blue lightning. Naturally, everyone freaked out and ran away and no one returned to the property, including the original DeVille. The family still owns the place, but Corella allows the Baddens to live there rent-free in exchange for maintaining it, something I'm not very confident they do. Now, Pongo and Mrs. actually fell asleep to that little history lesson, but they're suddenly woken up by the sound of puppies barking because the Baddens had finally let them into the gated yard for playtime. Only, something was a bit off. There wasn't just 15 puppies, there was close to 100. And here's where the Pongos come to understand the full extent of this rescue mission. It wasn't just about their puppies anymore, but the puppies of other Dalmatian parents all across England, and how they would never ever be safe while Corella DeVille continued to breed or at the very least work in fashion. So with the Pongos now fully aware of her scheme to turn every Dalmatian within reach into a coat, the stakes are higher than ever, and they formulate an escape plan that's pretty similar to the cartoon with only a few more steps. See, in order for Corella to maximize the amount of coats she can make from these dogs, she has to wait for them to grow in size, which means they're safe for the time being. And just like how the animated Baddens are obsessed with the TV, and in particular, a show called What's My Crime, these Baddens are the exact same way. So the Colonel wanted to continue watching over the pups from a safe distance in order to wait for them to grow big and strong enough to make the journey home. Meanwhile, whenever the Baddens would plop their malnourished butts in front of that silver screen for the night, Lucky would sneak a few puppies outside to train them for the journey ahead. It's a solid strategy that Pongo and Mrs. really appreciate because they're able to reunite with their pups and enjoy some quality time with them before making a break for it. Except they don't get nearly as much time together as they anticipated. Only a few hours into the reunion, Corella shows up at the house and tells her minions the police are on their trail and they have to kill the puppies tonight. And this is a part that both films were surprisingly faithful to. In the books, the Baddens ask how they should kill the pups and she says, poison them, drown them, hit them on the head. Have you any chloroform in the larder? And Saul responds, not a drop and no ether either. Meanwhile, the movies go down like this. Are we gonna do it? Any way you like, poison them, drown them, bash them in the head. You got any chloroform? Not a drop. And no ether. Ether. Either. Any way you want. Poison them. Drown them. Bash them on the head. Got any chloroform? I don't care how you kill the little beast, just do it and do it now! Pretty crazy, right? And similarities like this are peppered in all throughout both films. Though in this specific instance, the live action version proceeds to go off in its own direction. What I mean by that is by the time Corella even makes the call to the Skinner, the puppies are being rounded up and escorted out by the allies. Meanwhile, the bad guys just get their asses kicked for the rest of the entire movie. Sorry, I try not to swear in my Disney videos, but that's exactly what happens. The Baddens fall through floors, get hypothermia, fall balls first onto an electric fence. The Skinner literally has a chunk bitten out of his ass and Cruella, well, she gets it worse than anybody. From being kicked by a horse to being catapulted into a pig pen. And you know what that's filled with. Also, no joke, up until I started working on this episode, the only thing I remembered about this movie is the one clip where Cruella falls into a vat of brown stuff because it always played in the trailer. I've spent my entire life wondering what that brown stuff was and now I know it's molasses, which is even scarier than anything I could have imagined. See what I mean? Those air pockets, man, that freaks me out. 
As for the cartoon and book, though, after Corella gives her orders to execute the pups and leaves, the Baddens decide to wait until after they watch their favorite show, What's My Crime? Which I guess is supposed to be a parody of an actual game show called What's My Line? And this gives our hero puppies enough time to be escorted out of the house by their parents. And it's actually kind of funny, in the book, Lucky is the most intelligent of his siblings, so the colonel puts him in charge of disciplining them and teaching them to follow orders. But in the cartoon, Lucky replaces Cad Pig. He almost dies and then grows up to not only be the most obsessed with the TV, but his everlasting love for those moving pictures is almost what spoils the whole plan. In fact, he's kind of the screw up in the 1996 version as well. After the other puppies make their escape, he's left behind and has to be rescued from the Skinner at the last minute. I mean, I know they're just movies, but you gotta wonder why Disney did him so dirty. Anyway, chapter 12 ends with the pups being escorted to a nearby barn where they all fall asleep for the night and with the Colonel seeing the glow of the bad lanterns floating across the field as they search for their invaluable missing cargo. Okay, so the majority of the Dalmatian's journey home is not detailed in the movie, save for the very end. But there are a few connections, like them stopping in a barn full of cows so they can fill up on milk. Before that happens though, remember they're making this trip in the middle of winter, on Christmas Eve in fact. So the conditions are not easy for the puppies to handle, especially Cad Pig. So the Colonel borrows a little blue cart from his pet, the two-year-old boy Tommy, who happens to understand just a little bit of dog language, and the Cad Pig is pushed along in it by some of the bigger, stronger pups. Unfortunately, the Colonel does have to dip out not long after this because he can't leave his pets behind while traveling across the country, but lucky for the Dalmatians, shelter and food have been arranged for the next few days via the midnight barking. In the next chapter, they're about a half mile out from their next stop when they run into a caravan of gypsies, which is concerning because gypsies were known to steal valuable dogs. Not only that, but Dalmatians were one of their favorites because they're smart and could be trained to do tricks for money. After spotting them, the gypsies do their best to surround the dogs and trap them in a field, but little did they know that horses have a natural affinity for the breed as Dalmatians used to run alongside them when horse and buggies were the primary mode of transportation. So the horses that pulled their caravan pulled a slime one and unlocked the gate to the field while the gypsies were waiting for the Dalmatians to come out the other side, and this allowed the dogs to escape to a nearby bakery. Now you remember that part of the movie where the Dalmatians are at that old blacksmithing place and they roll around in soot to disguise themselves? themselves and get on the moving truck to go home, aka my favorite part of the game on Windows 98. Well, they also don disguises in the book, but it's just for good measure. The moving truck doesn't come up until the next chapter. After leaving the bakery slash chimney sweeps, they slowly make their way to the next town where they take shelter in a barn. At least the pups thought it was a barn. In reality, they hid out in a church, but at no point do they realize that because even though all dogs go to heaven, they don't necessarily understand the concept of religion. Skipping ahead just a little bit, as the dogs approach the next village, their would-be host runs out to meet them and says the bakery where they were going to be staying and that was also filled with their food is currently on fire and they have nowhere to go. And to make things worse, from a distance, the Dalmatians see Cruella standing on top of her car cheering the fire on like the maniac that she is, so they have to find an alternate route fast. As they're walking along the main road in complete view of anyone who drives down it, Pongo tells Perdita they'll need some kind of miracle to stay hidden, and not long after, after, that miracle presents itself in the form of a moving truck. There just so happens to be a Staffordshire sitting shotgun while his pets finish unloading the truck in a nearby house. And after Pongo explains their situation, he happily lets them all inside since they're dark enough that the owners won't see them in the back. I would be remiss if I didn't also mention that there's an intense moment soon after where Pongo, Mrs., and all 97 of their puppies are forced to close their eyes as Cruella drives down the road and passes the truck. Otherwise, she would see 99 pairs of eyes reflecting her headlights back at her. It's a totally different kind of intensity compared to the movie scene where DeVille and the Baddens try chasing the van down and even running it off a cliff before crashing into each other. But Dodie does an amazing job of stretching those few minutes out so you're just waiting in suspense, not knowing if one of the pups is going to screw the whole thing up. Fortunately, they all follow their father's orders and close those peepers up tight and not long after, the movers return to the van and start driving back to London. And I'm happy to report the Miracle on Wheels brought them safely across 
the 50 or so remaining miles of their journey. And after sneakily making their way out of the van thanks to the Staffordshire distracting the movers, Pongo and Mrs. lead the way back to Regent's Park where the Deerleys lived. On their way though, they came across Cruella's house where they also happened to run into her Persian cat. You know, the one that won't stop getting pregnant and basically forces Cruella to drown 44 of her kittens? Yeah, that one. Well, it turns out that cat has been holding a grudge for a while and knew all about the She-Demon's plot to make Dalmatian coats. And because she's such a cool cat, she invites all 99 of them inside to get some revenge while Cruella is at a dinner party somewhere. Using skills he learned from the Colonel, Pongo's able to unlock the door to the room filled with all the coats Mr. DeVille had made over the years, and the dogs and cat proceed to tear them to shreds. So satisfying. The dogs were able to sneak out just before Corella and her husband got back, but they lingered around to hear the reaction, which was just lovely. They both started coughing immediately from all the dander that was in the air, and when they realized what happened, Cruella shrieked like a banshee. That was all the dogs needed to hear though, so the family headed home. So now we get to the reunion, and each version of the story does it a little bit differently. The 1996 version is definitely the most far off. In it, the Dalmatians are found by authorities while they're walking across the fields and then promptly brought to the Deerleys, who take surprisingly little convincing to accept all 99 puppies. Especially when you consider how people would be clamoring to adopt the puppies from the famous missing Dalmatian case that was in all the papers. In the cartoon, we get a sad little look at the Deerleys' dogless Christmas when they suddenly come running through the door and the nanny realizes in 0.2 seconds that these black dogs are really the Dalmatians covered in soot. However, in the book, it takes a little more strategy. Pongo and Mrs. bark at the Deerleys' window and tell all their puppies to wait in the shadow so they don't get overwhelmed by the sight of 99 dogs. Only because they're covered in black, the Deerleys don't recognize them and tell them to run home. Pongo and Mrs. have to bark multiple times to get Mr. Deerly out of the house, and as soon as he opens the door, all those puppies were ordered to march inside like they owned the place. Then Pongo told them to roll on the floor to get the soot off, and the nannies and Deerleys finally realized they had themselves a Christmas miracle. Their dogs made it home. And a fun little twist is that Perdita's eight puppies who were taken from her in the beginning were among those 97 pups they rescued. Also, Corella's cat just shows up and says she's going to live with the Deerleys from now on and gives us an update on the DeVille household. Apparently, most of the coats that were destroyed weren't paid for yet, so Corella and her husband are financially ruined and have to leave London to escape their debts. Their new business plan is for Mr. DeVille to make plastic raincoats, which I guess you would say isn't quite as extravagant as fur. And you're gonna love this. The shock of seeing all of her destroyed furs made the black side of Krella's hair turn white and the white side turn green. So now you know where Billie Eilish got her inspiration from. And now we find ourselves on the final chapter titled The 101th Dalmatian. Some of you may have thought my count earlier was a little off. I kept saying 99 dogs and 97 puppies and you might've been thinking, but wait, if you include the parents and Perdita, that's still only 100. Well, chapter 18, which is basically an epilogue, is where the missing piece finally comes in. Now, the dearly soon learned that having 100 dogs would mean they need a much bigger place. In the cartoon, they solved this problem using the money Roger Radcliffe made off his Corella DeVille song being a huge hit on the radio. In the live action movie, Roger dearly has success with a video game he made that features Dalmatian protagonists and Cruella as the antagonist. So when both versions, she ends up being the butt of the joke. She despised Roger and thought he was a loser, but he makes a ton of cash by clowning on her. In the book though, he simply helps the government get out of debt a second time and they give him a yearly stipend as a thank you and the new money allows him to buy and renovate Hal Hall. You see, the Baddens were both arrested when they assaulted the man who came to repossess their TV, which had never been paid for, so there was a vacancy. Soon after moving in, they painted the whole thing white, except for the bricked up windows, which they left painted black, so now the house looked like a Dalmatian. That is not the final Dalmatian though. Actually, in a weird twist of fate, the owners of Perdita's long lost husband, Prince, rolled up to the property, presumably because they wanted to check out the Dalmatian plantation. As soon as Prince saw Perdita, he went crazy with excitement and the owners left him with the Deerleys because they saw how happy being there made him. And the story ends with one last addition to the family, a TV, which makes the cad pig very, very happy. 
So that, Solo fam, was the messed up origins of 101 Dalmatians, and I'd say Disney did a solid job converting it into an animated format without losing the original's charm. The live action version, while still great, didn't honor the source material quite as much, but I think that's because Disney was basing it more off the cartoon. Overall, it's better than their recent attempts at live action remakes though, so I'm really curious how Cruella is gonna turn out. But this wouldn't be messed up origins if I didn't talk about all the depressing things that inspired or happened as a result of this story, so buckle your seatbelts and grab some tissues. Now firstly, I'm happy to say that unlike other authors we've discussed, like Hans Christian Andersen and Rudyard Kipling, there wasn't any child abuse or borderline slave labor in Dodie Smith's personal life, at least not that I could find. She was simply a lifelong artist who loved Dalmatians and wrote a story starring them after her friend made that weird comment. However, I do want to talk about the impact that Disney's reimaginings of her book had on the well-being of Dalmatians in America. A lot of parents who saw the movie and wanted to put smiles on their kids' faces bought Dalmatian puppies without realizing how much work the breed actually is. They are very high energy and need a lot of room to play around, as is evidenced by the end of the movie, and most families just couldn't take care of them. So they were either abandoned out in the country and had to find their own way to survive, or were dropped off at the kennels. We don't know exactly how many dogs this happened to, thank God, because I'd probably break down and cry, but according to the American Kennel Club, registrations of Dalmatians decreased by about 90% from 2000 to 2010 after the craze around the 96 release and its sequel around 2000 had died down. Speaking of the sequel though, all three variants that we discussed today have a second installment. There's the aforementioned 102 Dalmatians, 101 Dalmatians 2, Patch's London Adventure, and the Starlight Barking. All of which have plots that could not be more different than each other, so don't expect a sequel to this episode anytime soon. As a matter of fact, I think that's where I'm gonna wrap this episode up. Thank you all so much for watching and if you made it to this point comment your thoughts about the story and your favorite dog breed down below i know they're all amazing but you've got to have a favorite also this episode took a lot of work i had to put 101 percent of my brain power into this thing so if you'd be so kind as to hit those like and subscribe buttons that'd be pretty cool only if you actually liked it and want to subscribe though if you thought the video sucked or you're just not into this kind of content normally then you can go on your merry way my feelings won't be hurt because I know you're wrong. Anyone who wants to stay updated on Messed Up Origins news or send suggestions my way, I'd recommend following me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, especially because YouTube system is beyond broken at this point. And if this behemoth of a video wasn't enough dog for you, follow this beautiful boy on Instagram. His sister's fur would probably make a better coat, but he's good for some laughs at the very least. I'll see you folks again soon with even more Disney content as well as some messed up mythology. Until that day comes, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.